Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Bodhi Tree Buddhism for a new series of classes. My name is Matt Osborne, and I am a New Zealander. I'm based here in Oxford in the UK. I teach at Oxford University, teach Buddha studies. Uh, some of you may be new to these courses at Bodhi Tree. Some of you uh, might be old friends. So welcoming anyone who's joining us now. It's been a while since I've done any classes online. Uh, so some of you may have been waiting a while. So my apologies for that. And um, some of the software and some of the, the Facebook interfaces and, and stuff have, have changed a bit and been a bit updated. I'm a little bit rusty. But hopefully everything should be working okay. Now, as some of you may know, my main background in uh, Buddhism is with the Chinese Buddhist traditions, mainly based in Taiwan. And for that reason, um, the classes that I want to do for this series uh, is based on a very influential, very important uh, modern classic by a great modern teacher. Uh, by the name of In Shun, Venerable Master In Shun. And the name of this book is called, uh, in English, it's called The Way to Buddhahood. Uh, in Chinese, it's Chang Fu Zi Dao. It's a really interesting book, and I'd like to just talk a little bit about that and also about the author before we begin. So, Venerable Master In Shun, he was known in Chinese as, uh, they don't use the, the, the usual name of like, like Fa Si, it's like Venerable, or Venerable Teacher, just a, a term for a monastic. They called him Dao Si, it's kind of like the mentor. He was a 20th century um, leader in Buddhism and Buddhist thought, originally from mainland China, and at a young age became a monk, uh, was very interested in study. He read a huge amount of Buddhist texts and classics. And as some of you may know, 20th century Buddhism was a really turbulent time. You've got, you know, this change from like a feudal empire to a, to a republic, um, civil wars uh, involved with World War II. It's a really chaotic time. And in that time, there was a group of uh, progressive innovators um, who were first promoting a movement called Renshan Fu Jiao, so like Buddhism for human life. And later this idea became known as Renjian Fu Jiao, humanistic Buddhism in English. And he was one of the, the great thinkers behind that. And some of the, the particular features of his thought were that, you know, a greater emphasis on Indian Buddhism. So for Chinese Buddhism, rather than relying on the classics of the different Chinese traditions and Chan and Pure Land and Huayan and Tiantai, he really wanted to get back to like Indian Buddhist texts and Indian Buddhist thought. Of course, he was using Chinese translations of these. Um, and from that, kind of like a new portrayal of the Buddha um, and so on and so forth. So a lot could be said there. We don't have time for that today, maybe in another class or something. Um, and because of his like, great erudition with the text, he was often invited to teach at these new um, Buddhist seminaries or Buddhist academies that were being set up all over China in the middle of the 20th century. And I believe it was in the in the 50s that he was invited to give a whole series of like a whole introduction to Buddhism, Buddhist thought, Buddhist practice at one of these seminaries. And for that, he he wrote, like his class notes were, were like verses. It's a very like Indian style, it's sort of like the writings of Nagarjuna or Asanga or Vasubandhu, you know, classic stuff. He wrote these verses encapsulating the key ideas of Buddhism um, and then later on, he then would provide an explanation for each of those verses. Um, what we're going to be using is just the verses um, with my own translation. Now, the the book is available, of course, in Chinese. You, you go to like any monastery in Taiwan, for example, you will be guaranteed to find a copy of this book on the bookshelves, um, multiple copies. Um, and there is an English translation that was made like 20 plus years ago. Um, I used to use that for some classes that I used to teach a long time ago um, at, at Faguangshan. But over the years, I've found that um, I, I made my own English translation. I wanted to be a bit, little bit more accurate and some particular terminology I wanted to change. So what we're going to be using for our notes in a minute 
I've got the Chinese in there and the English. So that those of you that are more interested in Chinese Buddhism, you can kind of like read along with the Chinese, learn a bit of the Chinese, what the English is. You'll see the Chinese and English right next to each other. Um, so that's kind of like how we're going to do it. We're going to do a verse or two or three in each little session. But before we even talk about that, maybe we need to talk about the whole structure of the text. So one of the ideas that Inshun had um, related to the Mahayana now, East Asian Buddhism has always been very Mahayana, you know, Bodhisattva path, attain Buddhahood. That's that's really the heart of all, all forms of East Asian Buddhism. But he also felt that because of that emphasis on the Mahayana, often people wouldn't look at non-Mahayana material, so-called Indian Buddhist material, and they were kind of like discarded. Oh, that's Hinayana, it's kind of inferior. But he felt that was the foundation. And even more than that, one of the very ideas for the humanistic Buddhism movement was that rather than talking about these like, you know, very profound philosophies and oh, that's just emptiness and, you know, um, storehouse consciousness, that one really needed just a foundation in being a good and decent human. So there's this notion of five vehicles, five vehicles, and they kind of relate to five different goals of practice. So the first one is what we call like the human vehicle. Um, and the goal of that is basically within Buddhist terms is how to live your life in a way such that in future lives you will be reborn as a human and like not just as a human, but like as a human and comfortable and happy. The second vehicle is called the divine vehicle. And the goal of that is to be reborn in the heavenly worlds um, with all the blisses of being a, a God, a deity. Now, these two are both similar in that their goals are not for liberation. Their goals are for happiness in this and future lives. Then the next step, the third vehicle, is actually the vehicle of the Shravakas, so the disciples of the Buddha, whose goal is to attain liberation as Arhats. Um, they want to get out of this cycle of endless rebirth, but that's it. They just, I would just want to get liberated, get me out of here. So that's the Shravaka vehicle. Um, the fourth one is the Pratika Buddha, the so-called solitary Buddha vehicle, which is also, in a sense, a way of liberation for oneself. And then the fifth and final vehicle is um, the Mahayana, the great vehicle, the path of the Bodhisattva to attain full Buddhahood. So you've got these five vehicles, five goals. The first two are for happiness in this and future lives. And the last three are for liberation, but only the final one is for liberation for oneself and others. And he thought that the whole structure of the text is you need the lower foundations to build the higher foundations. And so this is how it works. We start from the basics. Really, they're very simple stuff, and then you work through. So the, the first part of the text talks about refuge, for example. It goes into the five precepts, these types of practices for human and divine life. And then it goes into the path to liberation for the Shravakas, for the Pratika Buddhas. And finally, is a section on the Mahayana, the path of the Bodhisattva uh, for awakening for oneself and, one other, and others. So it's quite a structure, there's quite a bit to it. Um, I just needed to give you a really brief overview before we like jump on in and it starts off with uh, refuge. So let's do that now. I hope I'm looking at like my um, OBS interface so that I can be a bit more fancy than regular Facebook. I have no idea what's going on on the Facebook side. I hope everything's coming through. So I'm gonna now flip now and we're gonna start looking at the text, okay. Hopefully that's coming through. I hope that's coming through. Okay, so there you go. The way to Buddhahood versus Chang Fu to Dao. As I said, I'm just using the verses from the from the original Chinese with my own English translations, instructions from mod, modern Chinese master, and that is Venerable Master In Shun. Still got my old monastic name there. <laughs> English translation by Sui Huivang. Now this is just the contents, and you can see it's quite it's quite detailed. It's very well structured. And kind of just a note about the structure here, and this very the whole idea of him. Like writing a text in this way is partly based on the idea that, um, well, not the idea, but when Venerable Inshun was younger, uh, modern Chinese Buddhism was also having more contact with Tibet, and um, a number of scholars such as Fazun and Nanghai had gone to Tibet and they had first translated the great um, Tibetan work known as the, um, the treatise, the great treatise on the stages 
of the path to awakening, Lamrim Chinmo, um, which does exact a very similar structure. It starts right at the beginning, and it works right right way up to a, like the awakening of a Buddha. So it's got a similar structure, real basic stuff. Okay, so let's have a look what we've got here. Um, the first section is just called Going for Refuge and the Three Treasures. I've left the Chinese and everything just so that people can see. And I'm going to like read out, I'm going to do really old school. I'm going to read out the Chinese, read out the English. The sea of existence is without limit. The world has much sorrow and suffering. Flowing and revolving, rising and falling. What place is a refuge and support? Now this idea here at the start there, um, the sea of existence, um, is a common metaphor. Um, and the metaphor throughout this whole thing is the idea of samsara. That human beings, and, and all beings really, we are in this ocean. And it's an ocean without limit. There's no end to it. There's no immediate place where we can get out of that ocean. There's no shoreline, there's no island, there might even barely be a piece of wood to grab onto. Um, and within that there is much, and here we've got the term sorrow and suffering. Now if you know a little bit about Buddhism, you might know the term dukkha, which often gets translated as suffering. Sometimes we might want to translate it as dissatisfaction or very other, term, uh, other terms. Um, now it's not to say there's not pleasure and happiness at various points, but this is a really kind of deep-seated sense of just the suffering that comes about with life after life after death after death. So the third line there, flowing and revolving, um, in Chinese literally Liao Zuan, but actually this term is sometimes used as a translation for the word samsara. So if we look at this word samsara, you've probably heard about it if you know a bit about Buddhism, comes from the root uh, mashura to, to flow. That's often used for like the idea of a stream. Like you can think of like a, a rushing river, like a flooding river. If you think of like ancient India, of course, the idea comes from ancient India. Um, <clears throat> like a river in flood is very dangerous. It's going to wipe out whole villages. And within that raging river, there's these like little torrents, you know, little whirlpools that you get caught in it. And so people are huan more rising and falling. You you come out of that water, you grab a, gra a gasp of breath, and then poof, you're submerged back into it again. And so when we're caught in this, you can think of it as like you're caught in a flooded river, or you can think of it as being caught in like an ocean during a storm. What place is a refuge and support? So what are you going to do? Uh, what are we going to try to grab onto? to try to save us and, and keep our heads above the water. So the next thing the text talks about is, you can see the heading at the bottom there already, right? <laughs> Seeking refuge in things of this world. It's got two things, like things of this world, and it's got things beyond this world, shall we say, um, more spiritual things. So let's have a look at the first one. And there's two verses here. We'll have a look at them um, both. Qi ju jie sao san. And this is in quotes because this line actually comes from a sutra. All that is accumulated shall be lost and scattered. Those of renown and high status shall fall. Those who are united shall be separated. Those who are born all shall die. Now, within this, there's this really strong sense of of impermanence, another key idea in Buddhism that's closely tied with the idea of dissatisfaction. In fact, this is one of the very ideas of why why is life dissatisfying or you know why is existence dissatisfactory or or painful or suffering? One of those reasons is it's <clears throat> it's impermanent. Uh, we can't hold on to anything. So all that's accumulated should be lost and scattered. Um, to give you know some modern examples, um, you know, in the last few years, there's a lot of talk about billionaires, for example, and you know, there's all sorts of other ideas. I'm not going to go into the details of that. You know, billionaires, people who accumulate a huge amount. Um, now, I mean, people do that. We we think that there's some kind of security in that. You know, if I have a billion dollars, I'll be safe from everything. Um, let's have a look at a, a Steve Jobs. You know, made this 
the most successful company in the world for a while, accumulated billions of dollars, but all shall be lost and scattered. You know, we can say, well, he still had a billion dollars when he died. Sure, um, but he still passed away. You know, even his body, his billions of dollars could not stop what happened to his body in the end. It's trying to seek refuge in, in, in money, for example, or wealth, or possessions of some kind. But can this really save us, is the question. The second line, those of renown and high status shall fall. Um, again, some people think, you know, they can kind of attain immortality by by being famous, making some great, you know, contribution to the world. And that's certainly the case, you know, there are some people, the Buddha, <laughs> look at Jesus Christ, um, they live on, in a sense, in that renown and that contribution. Um, Julius Caesar, high status. Um, none of that status or renown protected them from their lives um, and what befell them. And even like another interesting example is in more recent um, years, particularly under the, under you know just a couple of years ago with the Black Lives Matter, and something sounds a little bit different, but in some ways similar, like the Me Too movements, people of this great status, but they also fell. Um, I mean, here at Oxford, we've got a few colleges that have like images and statues and sort of memorials to these great, famous British. Um, I mean, there are all sorts of different things. Like entrepreneurs, you could call them, um, during colonial times that are now being totally considered in a different light. That what was once considered high status are now being considered as you know people that perpetuated the oppression of others. That renown and so-called high status of a time is also not a refuge. It's not something that's lasting or endurable. Those who are united shall be separated. This is just the way of things, <laughs> you know. Um, we can think of that in, you know, just within the course of our lives. You have bestest friends when we're kids. Often we go separate ways in life. Um, I feel this a lot for myself. I'm a, I'm a New Zealander. I left New Zealand um, just about a month after my 26th birthday. I've been back to visit a few times, um, but since then, you know, I've lived in South Africa for four years, I've lived in Taiwan for many years, Hong Kong for quite a few years, I lived in Thailand, now I'm in the UK. Uh, many of my friends are kind of scattered all over the world. Um, it's, not, it's not a happy thing, you know, we're constantly being separated from those that we love, um, and again, this is just um, a fact of like impermanence. Even if we nowadays, you know, you can have a Zoom conversation, send an email, it's not a problem, but it's still not quite the same thing. So we try to seek um, refuge and support in various things, but we cannot control those circumstances and we're often separated from them. And then the last line, that's the real kicker, right? Those who are born all shall die. Or literally, um, for those who are born, there are none who do not die. Um, or you can just say, whatever's born, it's going to die. So when we're trying to seek them a refuge in things of this world, be it, be it wealth, be it status, be it um, social connections, fame, all these things, in the end, our life is short. And when we die, we're separated from that. None of those things can ultimately save us um, from death and having to leave all these things behind. So that's like a really interesting point of contemplation, <laughs> um, particularly that last one. Um, in in um, the, the Lamrim Chenro, that Tibetan text that I just mentioned, uh, one of the key ideas that the, the text starts with is um, a contemplation on death this idea that like, and you see that a lot in many of the Tibetan traditions. And and if you think about it, you totally see it in Buddhism as a whole, right? Why does Prince Siddhartha decide to leave the palace? Because he sees, you know, these four things. He sees old man, sick man, dead man, corpse. And then he sees, of course, the 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 religious practitioner trying to find a way out of it. So death then was, was a spur to, let's say, Oh, death, and you know, oh my, my kingdom's going to be lost, everything's going to be lost, what am I doing about it? And you, there was the same idea in those to be entered. By, by contemplating death as a really powerful spur um, 
to start one on the path. Now it's interesting that you've got this kind of mention here in this text by Venerable Master Inshon, but he doesn't give a big emphasis on death and he actually explains that. And part of it is simply the time when he was writing was a time of war, um, a time really of chaos. If you know, you know, history of China from like mid 19th century up until, you know, even end of the 20th century, chaos and war is just this ongoing theme. And he felt that that was something that was already in everyone's faces. They didn't need to. They didn't need extra reminder about that. And, and Buddhism was already sort of portrayed as this this religion too too closely connected with death, which being very kind of inauspicious, connected with like funerals. And the in the in the pre humanistic Buddhism period, Buddhism was just like Buddhism was for funerals. It was for the dead. It was to appease the ghosts of the dead. That's why they talked about Buddhism for human life. Um, so you can kind of see that in an entrance emphasis. But I think for those of us who are not at that time, maybe <laughs> the last couple of years, yeah, maybe we are getting a bit more of a, a shock to, to contemplate death. But it's still something worth thinking about. Thinking about our own mortality um, puts things in a different perspective. Do be careful. Um, for some people that can be very just depressing and not something that inspires us to then practice. It just gets us down. Like if you spend too much time, you know, if you're watching coronavirus updates every day for the past two years and now you're watching, you know, war updates every day, all day, it can be really draining. So you don't want to get in that mode. That's not the point. But to reflect on it, to think of the impermanence of our life is, is and can be very powerful. Um, idea. We've got one last verse here um, that goes together with this idea of seeking refuge in things of this world. Um, there we go. Uh, the well-governed state will fall into chaos. The world once formed faces destruction. Of all that is pleasurable in the world, none are a refuge or support. Now this opening line there I, to me really reflects the state of insurance China at that time. I think it was in the 50s. You know, even the whole state is in collapse. Um, the civil war, you know, when those things happen in the state of war in general, whether it's an you know, internal civil war or a collapse of an economy or something or, or war between other nations, that chaos, just life is hell, you know. And even beyond that, right, the world once formed faces destruction from the Buddhist perspective, like even this whole, you know, this cosmological level. I mean, this whole planet goes through this process of formation and change, and then it starts to disintegrate and fall down, and in the end it's destroyed. There, there are sutras on this, the Sutra of the Seven Suns, talking about, like, basically it seems to describe, from a modern physics point of view, like the sun going supernova and just, like, burning away all the planets, literally they're just the whole planet is just burnt to a crisp. I'm not talking about global warming burnt to a crisp. I'm literally turned like the planet itself is just destroyed. So there's a kind of cosmological level of impermanence and destruction of all that is pleasurable in the world. So all the things that we think of as being a source of happiness, shall we say, not necessarily just pleasure, but happiness, joy, None of these are an ultimate refuge or support because they're all impermanent. I mean, if the whole planet's going to ultimately be destroyed, and if our own lives will ultimately end, what refuge do we have in any of these things? Now, that's a pretty somber little message there to begin with, for sure. And I'm kind of like, I'm going to end this first class on this kind of note. Um, but it's a contemplation. And... This isn't just theory. Okay, so let's maybe talk for a moment then about, you know, this class is like a reading, like a reading a text class. Uh, but it's more than that, you know. It's um, it's it's a contemplation. It's a contemplation. All of these verses are verses for contemplation. And I hope you can use them like that. And this is this is why having them in this format of little verses is really good. Um, and so, for example, when these would be used um, as a course in a Buddhist college, you know, like a Buddhist seminary, um, 
some of my seniors in my in my generation at the Buddhist College, this wasn't a textbook, but the my teachers, from almost all my teachers, that was like a standard textbook, and they had to memorize them. They'd memorize the verses. Now nowadays, a lot of people are like oh, memorization. You know, that's not true learning. Uh, I mean, sure, like in a in a modern university, I mean, Buddhist studies memorization it's not the be all. You can't you can't write an academic journal paper by memorizing something. But in terms of your practice, it's really important. By memorizing it, you can reflect on it. You can contemplate. You can bring up that verse and think over it. Keep it in your mind. And that's what contemplation is. And that's what meditation is. It's not just a kind of legs folded, hands in the mudra, eyes looking down your nose, breathe in, breathe out, or chanting, you know, the name of Amitabha, or whatever other practice, or doing your tantra practice. That is certainly meditation. (laughs) <laughs> but meditation or cultivation, what in Chinese we call xiuxing, is far broader. And I think one part I see a lot in Western takes on Buddhism is that these kinds of reflections and contemplations tend to get downplayed more. People just want to go straight into like, I want to focus on this and attain samadhi, attain dhyana, become a Buddha or whatever. But before we do that, we need to, like, we need to just totally change our thinking about the world. And so reflecting on these, think about what is my refuge? What am I doing, you know, when things go wrong? When I'm stressed, what do I do? Is my refuge chocolate? Is my refuge Netflix? (laughs) Um, Is my refuge, what, sex, drugs, rock and roll? Um, Yeah, probably for some of us it is. Um, Is that really solving the problem? It might be this kind of temporary alleviation of stress, but that's probably about it. So think about that and then reflect upon the things that we take as kind of refuges in our lives and have a think about their impermanent nature and that ultimately they're not going to get us out of the problem. Next week we're going to come back and we're going to talk about some other refuges which are kind of refuges not of this world but we're not yet talking about Buddhism, we're not yet talking about the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha but even about Um, at least maybe we can call it other forms of spiritual practice (laughs) and thinking that these are going to resolve our problems and we can reflect also, are they? So that's about it for today. Um, I'm sitting here still looking at my OBS live streaming interface. I have no idea what's going on out there. Looks like there's a few viewers, but I can't see. Is my comments on? I don't know. It should be on. After we finish here, the comments, uh, well, this whole thing is going to stay up. Um, you, if you've got any questions, write them in the comments. We'll try to have a bit of discussion. As opposed to my last classes, which used to be like an hour and a half, and we do all sorts of things. I'm trying to keep these a little short and sweet, um, but I'm going to keep them coming uh, fairly regular, and hopefully we can just slowly work our way through this text, have a little contemplation each week, and uh, take it from there. So, my friends... It's great to see you all. Um, It's great to be back and connecting with you all. And it's great to share some Dharma with you. I'd like to wish you all the best in these admittingly troubled times. And just remember, um, with the Dharma, we've got a way out. We've got some solutions here. And so, as we're going to find out in a week or two, the Dharma is our refuge. Okay, everyone. Take care, and I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.